By the time I was growing up, Grandmother and Uncle Hal were relegated firmly to the background. But there was a terrible scene one night in the dining room when Mother was having a small dinner party. Uncle Hal arrived in what appeared to be a desperate frame of mind. I heard Mother calling him a drunk and telling him to leave immediately or she'd call the police. Uncle Hal had come to ask her for money, and they'd had a fight about it. Uncle Hal was crying now and pleading with her. I don't know if he was drunk, but I remember that he looked terribly upset and kept saying that she'd ruined his life. In a little while, the police did come and forcibly took him away. I never saw Uncle Hal again after that night. I heard Mother say to someone on the phone that Hal was in a sanatorium. She'd had him committed for three years. He was another of those people in my childhood who made my mother mad and then disappeared forever. Shortly after the incident with Uncle Hal, Grandmother was not allowed inside the house at all. The last time I saw her was through the back screen door. She handed the chocolate pie and banana cake to us as usual, and my brother and I tried to be cheerful, but all three of us had tears in our eyes. We did sneak the screen door open quietly so it wouldn't squeak, and we each hugged her. Both of us gave her a big kiss and whispered, Goodbye, Grandma. We closed the screen door very carefully without making a sound. After that, Grandmother didn't come to visit us anymore. We asked if she was sick, but Mother didn't want to talk about it. She seemed angry and said Grandmother was ungrateful. After all, she supported her and gave her a car. What more did she want? There was no pleasing Grandmother, she said. Grandmother died in August 1958 without ever seeing her Lucille again. Mother had been too busy to leave New York while her mother was still alive, but she did fly to Los Angeles to make the funeral arrangements at Forest Lawn. It was after I'd moved back to California in the early 60s that I heard Uncle Hal had died. He was all alone then, living in a downtown hotel and working as a night clerk. This upload presented by the concluding chapter of Crawford. Grandmother and Uncle Hal. I've often thought they paid a terrible price for the early years they shared with my mother. In 1946, when Joan Crawford won the Oscar for Best Actress in the picture Mildred Pierce, she was not present to accept. She was at home in bed with pneumonia. I remember the night. Mother had been in bed all day. Friends called periodically to see if she was going to be well enough to attend, but she told everyone she was too ill. Late that night, the all-important call came through. She had won the Oscar. Her health seemed to improve dramatically. She bounded out of bed and took a shower. She put on some makeup and her prettiest negligee with a satin bed jacket. She brushed her hair and waited for the photographer to arrive. Her director, Michael Curtiz, brought Oscar to her, and the photographer snapped pictures from all angles. They shared champagne and congratulations. After everyone else left, I stayed with her for a while. She sat holding her Oscar, turning him around to view from every angle. She let me hold the statue for a few minutes. He was surprisingly heavy. Then we walked down the stairs together, and she placed him all alone in a special little niche at the bottom of the staircase. Mother stepped back to admire him. Turning to me, she said with a note of sarcasm, I said I wouldn't be there, but I never thought it would turn out like this. I was seven, and my brother was four, when we spent the winter of 1946 and 47 back east in New York for reasons that were never explained. Mother rented a big house in Bedford Village, New York, and that's where Chris and I lived while Mother stayed in the city. Before we left for the house in the country, Mommy took us to lunch at the 21 Club, after which we were going to see a matinee performance of the Broadway musical Annie Get Your Gun, starring Ethel Merman. Mommy had just won the Academy Award a few months earlier, and she was a big star again. We'd heard rumors that there was public unrest in New York City that winter, but she didn't pay much attention to it, even though in Los Angeles, Mommy had a bodyguard named Lou Bennett, who accompanied her on all public appearances. We were just finished with lunch at 21 when Uncle Bob Crindler came to the table to talk with Mummy. It seemed that there was a sizable crowd gathered outside the restaurant waiting to see Joan Crawford. It was not the usual small, faithful band of fans who followed Mummy wherever she went. This crowd was different. They were restless. Mummy hurried us into our coats and hats. Our nurse, Miss Brown, was stationed between us. 
Mommy told us to hold on to her hand tightly when we left the restaurant and head straight for the limousine no matter what happened. Outside, I could see people pressing against the iron grillwork at the top of the stairs. I could hear what sounded like angry voices. Uncle Bob was now on the phone calling the police. He wanted Mommy to wait inside until the police arrived. Mommy said she'd never had any trouble with fans before, and we'd be late for the matinee, she'd promised us, if we waited any longer. The waiters formed a living wall around Mommy, Miss Brown, little Christopher, and myself as we left the restaurant. The moment those big, heavy doors opened, I could feel a rush of cold air and hear the angry shouts of the huge crowd. The strange, angry people were everywhere. They were down the stairs in a flash, surrounding our little family and knocking down some of the waiters. They were hanging from the roof that covered the stairway to the street. It couldn't have been more than 15 or 20 feet from the front door of the restaurant to the door of our limousine, but we couldn't get there. Literally hundreds of people were shoving pens, pencils, and autograph books at my mother. We were separated from her and from Miss Brown, who had been knocked down. I was terrified. I clung to my brother and tried to protect him with my own body. But the big people swept the two of us up in their own momentum. Chris and I were clinging together, crying. Mommy realized that she'd lost us somewhere in the crowd. I heard her voice over the others. Mommy was screaming, My babies! Don't hurt my babies! Finally, the police arrived with their nightsticks. By that time, Mommy was nearly hysterical. Chris and I were sobbing as we tried desperately to keep from being trampled underfoot by the big people. I couldn't see anything. Even in this bitter cold weather, there was the rancid smell of wet wool and sweat. I barely managed to keep my brother and myself standing upright in the stampede. A policeman grabbed us and carried the two of us still clinging to each other to the merciful safety of the limousine. The police pulled Mommy away from the crowd, and once she was inside the car, the police beat people away and slammed the door. Our driver couldn't move the limousine even one inch. There were crazed people all around us, beating on the car, climbing on top of it and peering upside down into all the windows. More police arrived and forced the crowd off the car and back onto the sidewalk. When the policemen in their cars finally cleared a path for us, the chauffeur slowly began moving the long black limousine away from the crowd. Miss Brown was not with us. She'd been stabbed in the head with a ballpoint pen and had to be taken to the doctor. Mommy calmed us down and wiped our tears. She looked us over very carefully to see if we'd been hurt. Since we appeared only to be shaken up, she decided that the best thing for us to do was to go to the matinee as planned. It would take our minds off of what had just happened. We arrived at the theater just as the orchestra had started the overture. In the darkness, an usherette led us to our aisle seats in about the tenth row. Mommy sat with us until the play started and then left. Poor Mommy spent the first act in the ladies' room throwing up. She had to go back to the apartment and go to bed. My brother and I had a wonderful time at Annie Get Your Gun. Miss Brown was back from the doctors by the end of the second act. But after that day, I didn't care much for either fans or large crowds. Although my mother received two additional Academy Award nominations in 1947 and 1952, she viewed the rest of her career as an uphill battle. Some of the joy had gone out of it. She had reached the peak too soon, too young. Now she was backsliding. So she became more entrenched in her own preconceived notions about the world while clinging desperately to the maintenance of her image as a star. It was the image itself she nurtured, and with it she tried to turn back the clock. She began to drink more than just socially. It was then that the fan mail began to take on more importance. It was the last measure of her old glory, and she devoted herself to answering every last piece of it, autographing every single photograph personally. This was something she could control. The fans became the source and wellspring of her feeling of stardom. As her films steadily declined, the fan mail was an infusion of her life's blood, the last vestiges of hope she had to hold on to. When I was a very little girl, Christmas was like having a department store wrapped up and delivered under our tree. We always had a huge tree. It touched the ceiling. I used to sit for hours looking at the lights dancing their way merrily across the shiny red, blue, green, and silver balls. The radio played Christmas carols. Cook made special holiday treats, and it was a glorious time. 
One Christmas Eve, when I was about six, I lay in my big four-poster bed and listened to hear Santa Claus. The next morning, I announced that I had really heard Santa arrive with his sleigh and reindeer on our roof. Christmas morning followed the same pattern. Chris and I would wake up and run downstairs. The library door would be closed and locked. Behind that library door would be Christmas waiting for us. We would try to peek through the keyhole, but we couldn't see much. I never knew exactly why, but the regular schedule had to be followed on Christmas morning like any other day. So we ate breakfast, did the dishes, made our beds, and then got dressed. By that time, Mother was usually up, and our Christmas could begin. Like wild Indians, we dashed into the library the minute she opened the door. Magically, the Christmas tree lights were on, and the gifts piled high everywhere you looked. It was beautiful. Special presents from Santa were placed around the tree. They were the first ones we got, things like bicycles, stuffed animals, or outfits of clothing. After that, we had to take turns opening presents. Each one had to have a thank you note written for it, so we had to write on the back of each card. We had brunch with Mother. Then in the afternoon, we could go out and play with our new toys, just like other children. As the years progressed, our Christmas became less a family holiday and more a public spectacle. The presents were put on display for the many guests who came over on Christmas Day for open house. The tree was moved from the library to the front entrance hall, directly opposite the front door. Many times we weren't allowed to open all of the gifts until there were other people to watch. Then each of us could take one package and open it in front of the small audience of guests. By the time I was nine, our family Christmas was mostly for show. There were still lots of presents under the tree, but we were not allowed to keep the majority of the ones that were given to us by Mother's friends. We never saw most of the gifts once Christmas was over. At first, we were allowed to choose which gifts we'd like to have, and if she agreed, we kept them. The rest of the Christmas presents were stored in closets and carefully labeled. We had to take them rewrapped to birthday parties during the remainder of the year. It was usually the best of the presents that we couldn't have because Mother didn't want to be embarrassed by giving children of other movie people cheap presents for their birthdays. We were required to smile dutifully when visitors and guests expressed awe and admiration, even envy, over the number of beautiful gifts and asked us if we knew what lucky children we were. There were times when I just wanted to scream that it was all a fake. There really was no Christmas, and this was all a scene from another movie starring Joan Crawford and her four lovely children. But I didn't scream. I didn't say anything. I didn't even try to tell them the truth, because nobody would have believed me anyway. But categorically, the worst thing about the entire holiday was the thank you notes. It was tedious beyond words. My hand would get stiff, and my back would begin to ache. I wasn't allowed to listen to the radio or play any records. The silence was broken only by the sounds of my own paper and pen. After a couple of days of this solitary confinement, the task was nearly finished. I took the stacks of notes to my mother. To my horror, she started making marks through them with her pen. She said with a note of contempt that my writing wasn't clear enough or this line was slightly crooked. She became angry as she told me she didn't think I'd said nearly enough about how wonderful the present was. With a sinking heart and a hatred of her I could barely conceal, I took the notes she'd thrown back at me upstairs to write over again. It became a never-ending process. No matter how hard I tried to make them perfect the first time, she found something wrong and I had to write them over two and three times. As Christmas vacation dragged on, my other privileges were gradually taken away because I hadn't finished the thank you notes. If I dared complain, I had more work given to me as a punishment. Mother bawled me out for being the most ungrateful child she'd ever known, and then I got into more trouble for my sour face and bad attitude. I hated Christmas. It was with some astonishment that I heard a radio recording made in 1949 about our family Christmas. Here's how it went. It's easy to see, looking over the gigantic group of packages under the tree now, that the youngsters will have enough presents to keep them busy for months. Yes. 
You see, I don't let them have all their presents at one time. They'll get to play with them all, you know, all day tomorrow. And then we put a large group of them aside. From tomorrow on, they earn their gifts. How do you mean they earn them? Well, if they stay on their good behavior, they're given their choice of what present they want next. Christopher had his birthday in October, and he still hasn't received all of his presents. I suppose you give away a good many things. We don't give away any of the Christmas presents. I don't think that would be fair to the people who send them. But what we do do is to have a complete house cleaning three times a year. Every plaything, every article of clothing is carefully gone over and large bundles go to the children's homes and hospitals. Do the children help you with this? Oh, yes. I think it's excellent training for them. I always see to it that they give up something they really love. Otherwise, they don't really learn the value of giving. I was dressed up and paraded out in front of interviewers and photographers with my little rehearsed responses and photo-perfect smile, echoes of Mother's constant drive for perfection and gentility. Out of the cauldrons of Hollywood's melting pot, she had clawed her way to the top, and now we were the final stars in the crown, proving her not only successful but also morally superior. It was a case of extremes. One minute we were treated like privileged royalty with reporters paying careful attention to our every word, and a few minutes later, we were just servants doing mother's bidding. At times, when there was no man around, my mother often wanted to go out anyway. On those evenings, she told me that I was going to be her date. The two of us would get dressed up and get into her black Cadillac. One night at the beachcombers, a tall, strange-looking man came to our table. Mother greeted him warmly and introduced him as Howard Hughes. He stayed with us through most of the meal and was obviously trying to get Mother to be more than just cordial toward him. When he finally realized that he wasn't getting anywhere, he kissed her on the cheek and left. He's weird, I whispered to her, not entirely sure he was out of earshot. Mother laughed. He's Howard Hughes, Tina, and he's very rich. It was while we were waiting for the check that she told me that years ago, when Howard Hughes was just starting in the film business as a producer, he'd wanted to put her under contract. She had refused him a number of times, even though he was offering her a tremendous amount of money. She said she didn't want to ruin her reputation. She said that Howard wanted to buy people, that he wanted to own people. More than once, he'd put an unsuspecting, ambitious young actress under contract, and she'd never do one movie. She might not see him for months at a time, but she had to be at his beck and call 24 hours a day. Mother said that other women were used for exploitation, and she didn't want any part of that. I thought about him for a while as my mother was paying the check and felt sorry for him. He was a strange, tall, rumpled man who seemed ill at ease with us and with himself. When we got home, having discussed the entire evening in detail during the drive, Mother would often ask if I wanted to sleep with her. It wasn't an open question. It was more like a request. I always felt bad about saying no for fear it would hurt her feelings. She had two giant beds in her room, one at either end of what we called her sleeping porch. Sometimes I would sleep in the other big bed, but sometimes she would want me to sleep in the same bed with her. She divided her bed into two parts down the middle using great big pillows. She said it was so we wouldn't bump into one another during the night. Then she got into her half, and I crawled into my half, and she went to sleep. I would lie awake for ages. There were two things I didn't like about sleeping with my mother. One was that her blankets were so heavy I felt like I was being buried alive. The other was I couldn't move. She claimed that I wiggled incessantly in my sleep and said that it woke her up. So I would try to remember not to wiggle, which meant not moving all night long. I was so worried I'd wiggle and she'd wake up mad at me that I tried not even to go to sleep. Finally, of course, I'd doze off, but I woke up in the morning stiff as a board from trying not to wiggle. This upload presented by the concluding chapter of Crawford. I was a very good student, even in the elementary grades, and I enjoyed school. Because the work became increasingly easy for me, my teachers decided to skip me ahead one half grade. So, over a weekend in February, I went from the top of the third grade to the top of the fourth grade. The transition wasn't particularly difficult except for one subject, math. Somehow, in the moving process, I had missed a significant part. 
I had to have Mrs. Howe tutor me after school for the rest of that year. That same year, in a burst of civic-mindedness, my mother directed our Brownie Troop production of Hansel and Gretel. She held rehearsals on the small stage in our own theater and managed her little troopers very patiently. We were very excited the day of the performance as we put on our costumes and Mother helped each of us with our makeup. Unfortunately, I got a classic case of stage fright during my acting debut and forgot half of my lines, which shortened the play by about ten minutes. Mother was very strict about where she let me go, so most of my friends had to come to my house to play. My two best friends from school were named Judy and Cynthia. Judy and I started out as arch rivals. She was the tetherball champ, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't beat her. After school one day, we met behind the fence and had a fist fight, just like the boys. I didn't have any more success winning our fight than I had at tetherball, and after Judy landed a solid punch that gave me a whopping black eye, we called a truce. With my school friends, Mother had a peculiar habit that I found embarrassing. She insisted that they call her something other than Miss Crawford. At first, she suggested that they call her Aunt Joan. Then, to my total horror, Mother suggested the name of Stinky. The girls were as taken aback as I was, but Mother repeated it. Stinky. She wanted my friends to call her Stinky. It was humiliating for me to hear the girls call her Stinky to her face, and even worse when they made a big joke of it at school behind her back. When the other kids teased me about it, I just told them to go to hell. But that wasn't nearly as bad as some of the other things the kids said. First, there was the whole business about my not having a father. I tried to explain that I was adopted, and Mother said that made me specially wanted. What I got in return for my explanation was snickers and pointed remarks about being a bastard. It was so unusual for someone to admit being adopted in the 1940s that I didn't meet any other adopted children outside my own family until many years later. The common practice then was for parents not to tell their children they were adopted until the children were nearly grown up, if indeed they ever divulged the truth. At first, I didn't realize what was going on with some of the kids I met during the fourth grade. It was a confusing time because they teased me about dressing funny, about not having a father, and then for no good reason, they'd be very nice to me. Since it was well known that I hardly ever was allowed to go anywhere, the only way to pursue their friendship was for me to invite them over to my house. Sure enough, the children would arrive Saturday right on time to go swimming. One or another of the kids would bring up the subject of my mother being a movie star. Someone else asked if my mother would give them an autographed picture. In a short while, the afternoon would be over and the kids left with their movie star pictures tucked under their arms. Up until that time, I'd seen only one of Mother's movies, Humoresque, with John Garfield. Oh, I was in love with John Garfield. He was my hero. I was just eight when I saw that movie. To my horror, at the end of the picture, my mother walked into the ocean and died. I'd been sitting next to her during the film, but she'd gotten a phone call and left before the movie ended. When the lights went on again, I turned to hug her, but she wasn't there. For an awful moment, I thought the movie was real and that my mommy was really dead. I screamed and ran out of the theater like a crazy person. I ran everywhere looking for her, screaming, Mommy, Mommy, till finally I found her in the house, still talking on the phone. I threw myself across her, sobbing in agonized relief. Anyway... Monday at school, I'd bounce up to the same kids who had just been at my house swimming on Saturday, and the reception was entirely different. They didn't act like my friends at all. I was very hurt and didn't understand what could have happened. One day, I was nearly in tears over this situation. After school, my friend Judy and I sat down to talk about it. It was Judy who finally told me the truth. All those kids wanted was to see a movie star's house and get the autograph to prove it. I was so mad at Judy that we nearly had one of our old fights. I called her a liar and rode off on my bike in a total fury. I didn't talk much at home that night. When it was time to go to sleep, I lay awake in my bed going over and over the past few months. I knew that Judy had told me the truth. After those kids saw the house and got their autographed photo, they weren't my friends anymore. I felt like a pawn, 
constantly being used by all sides of my small world. Once, I ran away from home. Before I got very far down Sunset Boulevard, I heard the sound of screeching brakes as Mother's black Cadillac came to a dusty halt. She jumped out of the car and hauled me off the street. She was furious with me and demanded to know what in the world I was doing and where I was going. Scared to death, I mumbled something about Cynthia's house. Driving like a maniac, she took me to my friend's house, where she told the entire family about my runaway plans. They were sympathetic, but clearly wanted nothing to do with the situation. Going home in the car, Mother asked me how come I always seemed to like everyone else's house better than my own. She said, every time you go over to someone else's house, they always have such glowing reports about how helpful you are which is odd because you never want to lift a goddamn finger in your own house. As I sat there listening to her, I wanted to run away all over again. Somehow she turned the reports of my good behavior into a condemnation of me. I didn't know how she did it, but I knew I couldn't win. Over one weekend in February, I skipped another half grade at school and went from the middle of fifth grade to the middle of sixth grade, leaving all my friends behind. Before I'd had a chance to make any new friends, Mother transferred me to the Chadwick School in Palos Verdes. The house mother came out to greet us with a friendly smile and showed us to the room I was to share with three other girls. I became very shy and hardly said a word. I was beginning to be unsure of myself. It was time for Mother to leave. I was overcome with a sense of panic. I burst into tears and clung to her. She held me for a moment and then very firmly made me let go of her. I wanted to go home and forget all about boarding school. She said that was impossible. I was continually homesick. On weekends when I went home, I would cry all the way back to school. Even Mother cried sometimes and said she'd miss me. I began to notice that my brother and sisters had developed relationships that didn't include me. Sometimes there were new servants. Often, Mother had a new boyfriend. Many weekends, there were parties, and I had to help with the work. That summer, I turned 11. One night, I'd been watching television by myself when I heard a noise coming from the office two rooms away. I heard what sounded like screaming. I dashed through the door, and when I ran into the room, I saw Uncle Vincent hitting my mother. She was sprawled across a chair trying to defend herself. I flew at Uncle Vincent, pounding on him with my fist, trying to kick him and screaming at him to let go of my mother. I'd heard other fights my mother had with men, but I'd never actually seen one of them before. Uncle Vincent managed to get a grip on both my arms and hold me away from him. Mother told Uncle Vincent he'd better leave. A few days later, my piano recital was being held at our house. Mother informed me the morning of the recital that she had invited Uncle Vincent. I stared at her appalled. She said that no matter how I felt, I had to be polite, and she'd appreciate it if I'd apologize to him. Apologize? I said no. Flat out, no. I wouldn't apologize because I hadn't done anything wrong. She looked at me with those icy blue eyes and said it would be necessary for me to say I was sorry. I was sorry, all right. I was sorry she'd invited him. I was sorry I had to have this stupid piano recital. I was sorry I had to play hostess, and I was very sorry I hadn't just let him beat her up or do whatever it was that happened during those fights she'd been having with men since I was seven years old. I decided that this was the last time I'd try to intervene. I was not going to be humiliated anymore. There was something about these situations I didn't understand. After I apologized, the subject was not mentioned again. But nearly 20 years later, when I was an actress myself, Uncle Vincent was one of the few people from my childhood who actually helped me. He hired me to do a part on one of the television shows he was then directing. Near the end of August that summer I turned 11, I was in my bathroom changing clothes one afternoon. I noticed a spot on my pants, and when I took them off, I saw blood. I let out a shriek sounding like a wounded animal. After Mrs. Howe calmed me down and told me what to do to take care of my new condition, she left me alone in my own bathroom. 
I burst into a renewed fit of despair and threw myself on the floor. I kicked my feet and pounded my fists. I couldn't see anything so wonderful about becoming a woman. I tried very hard to make my feelings understood. I fainted and took to my bed. I got terrible cramps and took to my bed. I got headaches and took to my bed. I was convinced that the doctor could have remedied the situation, but no matter how much I pleaded, no one would do anything except get that strange smile on their face. I hated not being allowed to go swimming, not being allowed to play kickball or climb trees. I hated the messy stuff that went with trying to cope with this new stage of my life. So I stamped my feet and pounded my fists and sobbed my heart out to no avail because puberty and my period were inevitably upon me. During the next year at Chadwick, I began to appreciate that I was in a different and rather special school. My seventh grade class was larger, and I was no longer the new person. I made friends and liked my classes, but those were not the major differences. The first thing that dawned on me was that the rules were not nearly as strict as the ones I lived with at home. The disciplinary system was also more fair than at home. The third difference that set Chadwick apart was the other students. Most of them came from motion picture industry families, and many of them were from what used to be called broken homes. We used to have a joke about divorce. Kid one, how do you like your new father? Kid two, I like him a lot. Kid one, yeah, I liked him too. We had him last year. The nice thing about being at Chadwick was that you didn't run into the inevitable. What's it like to be a movie star's daughter? I felt a sense of companionship and understanding that I hadn't experienced at public school. Commander and Mrs. Chadwick were remarkable people who ran their school with love, dedication, and hard work. In 1950, Chadwick was a coeducational country boarding school with a working farm on the property. The fields grew hay and wheat, and the farm raised chickens, pigs, and rabbits for the dining room. The school also had a stable and some horses. Not much of the Palos Verdes area had been developed yet, so there were wide open spaces to ride. As the months went by, my life seemed continually to improve. In the spring of 1951, when I was 11 and a half years old, an event occurred that would change my life forever a definitive experience that tore the fabric of my emotional life into shreds so small I wondered if I'd ever be able to piece it all together again. I had been listening to the stories of some of the older girls at night in the dorm. In between the whispers and giggles and the long silences, I had begun to put together the excitingly romantic story of one girl's adventures with the boy who was in charge of running the stables. I arranged to meet that boy on a Friday night. He was older than I, about 16, and not in my group of friends. With my heart beating a mile a minute, I signed out after dinner for the basketball game. In fact, no one paid much attention to the cleanly scrubbed 11-year-old girl sitting on one of the back benches. At halftime, when everyone else went to the bathroom, I left the court and disappeared into the darkness at one turn in the path. There was only a small sliver of a moon, and I could barely see where I was going. Carefully, I crept around the protective edge of the board walls and past the big stack of hay bales. I stood in silence for a moment, looking at the tall, dark-haired boy. He walked toward me and smiled. I didn't move. This upload presented by the concluding chapter of Crawford. Standing next to me in the semi-darkness, he took my hand. Inside the stall it was even darker than in the pale moonlight. There was the smell of fresh hay and old wood, of leather and horses. These were all happy smells for me, familiar smells of days spent riding with my braids flapping behind me and a sense of freedom as my horse galloped through the countryside. He kneeled down on the hay and drew me to him. I was glad it was so dark because I felt very awkward. He was gentle and easy and I started to relax when he kissed me. I lay back on the soft, crinkly hay and heard it rustle beneath me as we moved. He was so warm and the sensation of his hand on my body so comforting that I didn't even realize that he'd unbuttoned my shirt. 
I struggled a little bit, but as he continued to kiss me, he put his jacket underneath me, and I never felt the hay as my jeans slipped down below my knees. I never had any experiences with the boy before. I had no real idea what adult sex was all about because no one ever talked about it. All of a sudden, a stab of pain shot through me like a rocket, making me scream. My whole body contracted with pain, and involuntarily I started crying. He slapped his hand over my mouth so that no sounds actually escaped. The pain disappeared as quickly as it had occurred. I, I didn't know what had happened. He lay on top of me now and held me very tightly. I was scared. I felt I'd been hurt somehow. He dried my few tears and continued to kiss me gently. You've never done this before, have you? He asked. I shook my head no. How old are you? He whispered. Almost twelve, I replied. He let out a low whistle between his teeth. Somehow, I was a disappointment to him. Then he said, "Let me tell you something, and try to remember this as you're growing up. Don't let just anybody do it. You choose who you want, and be careful." I nodded my head in agreement, and then he helped me get dressed. He kissed me once more when we were standing in the doorway to the stall. Without saying any more, I walked away into the darkness. That would have been the end of it, I guess, except that Sunday afternoon I was summoned into Mrs. Chadwick's office. Later that same day, they had a doctor examine me. No matter what the doctor said, the rumor was that I'd either been raped or had an affair with this boy at the stables. Except for one brief moment of pain, I felt a closeness, a moment of belonging, a sense somebody cared about me. I didn't want to be a bad girl. I, I never started out to do anything terrible. My mother's reaction hurt me very much. Of all people, I thought she'd understand. She had so many boyfriends, told so many dirty jokes about sex, got undressed in front of half the world. I didn't understand why she was so mean to me, calling me a whore and refusing to even listen when I tried to explain. The next afternoon, I was back in Mrs. Chadwick's office. She told me the boy was going to be expelled. Mother didn't want me at home for a while. My final punishment was to be 100 hours of hard work. During the time that I was working off my punishment, I was to be allowed no privileges. Until that very moment, I had not realized the full impact of what had happened. In its own way. This was just as bad as the night raids at home. Only I wasn't being physically beaten. Mother was still angry with me after several months, so she didn't come to visit me, and I didn't go home until the end of the school year. In the middle of 1951, Mother did one of her last pictures for Warner Brothers. It was not a very good film, and she knew it. She also probably knew that she wasn't going to be under contract to that studio much longer. She tended to suffer alone rather than to let anyone know she was hurt. That may have spared her ego to some extent, but it kept people, including her children, at a distance. She had a terrible time trusting anyone or letting others see that she was human with the failings and frailties that usually implied. She made mistakes, but she wouldn't admit them. She lied to herself about life as it went on around her until she could no longer tell the difference between reality. And her personal version of it, she put great store in personal willpower and attributed her own success to it. It was translated into rules governing all facets of household management, the children's discipline, and her own career. She believed that enough rules, rigidly enforced, would keep the world in order. It was a way of holding back total chaos. There is no creature more perverse than the human being. If there is chaos in a life, no amount of regulation and willpower holds it in abeyance forever. The inner turbulence will find the weakest link in the armor of each personality. For my mother, that weak link was alcohol. I thought about the times mother seemed to be different, and I never knew why. Then I realized that it was usually in the evening after she'd had a few drinks. 
Then I thought about the aspirin in the morning. A hangover would explain why she was so mean in the morning, even if she'd slept until nearly noon. I'd heard other kids talk about their parents' drinking problems. I tried to think back over those conversations and sort this out for myself, since I was certain there wasn't anyone I could trust to discuss it with me. Word of mother's rampages filtered back to the employment agencies. The turnover at our house became common knowledge, and eventually the agencies wouldn't send us any applicants. So my mother hired one of the fans as a secretary and another fan as a nurse. There were only four eighth grade girls who were boarding school students that year, so it was decided we would all live at the Chadwick's house and not at the dorm on campus. At the beginning of school, there was nothing to indicate that this was going to be such a difficult year for me, except perhaps the second chance attitude at home. Mother's strategy with the family was divide and conquer. One of us kids had to be in trouble all the time. Now it was my brother's turn to be the family scapegoat. I was at school most of the time, so he was next in line. Mother whipped him at the slightest provocation. Chris began to change from a happy, charming little prankster with the mischievous twinkle in his eyes to a high-strung young boy. As I watched the hateful way Mother treated my brother, I realized for the first time that she really didn't like men. The real reason Chris was being punished was that he'd ceased being the adorable little baby and was turning into a boy who would soon grow into a man. Part of Mother's hostility to her son was a spillover from her childhood bottle with her own brother. She had never experienced a positive relationship with a man. When she was a child, three fathers deserted her. Later, she annihilated her older brother, and in her adult life, all three of her marriages had ended in divorce. In later years, Mother professed to be mortally afraid of her son. If so, her fear was the result of her own guilty conscience. Better than anyone else, she knew those years of abuse, whippings, and tying the boy down every night in bed. All Chris ever tried to do in his early years was to get away from her and survive. Mother had long talks with Mrs. Chadwick. She said I was a bad influence on my brother and sisters. She said it would be better if I didn't come home for a while. I knew why she didn't want me at home anymore. I was old enough now at 12 to understand, to see what was going on in the madhouse. I was a witness to the beatings she gave my brother, the revolving boyfriends who came and went at all hours of the night, her increasingly serious problem with alcoholism, the homosexuals she surrounded herself with, and her inability to control that violent temper she unleashed periodically. I wasn't old enough to intervene. I couldn't do anything to stop her. But when I looked at her square in the face, she knew I understood all of it, and she found my knowledge intolerable. So she turned the turmoil at home into a reason for banishing me. I didn't particularly want to stay at school every weekend, but in a way it was a relief. At least I knew what to expect from life there. The better I did, the harder Mother tried to find something wrong with me. She insisted on perpetuating her image of me as a bad girl who lied and was not to be trusted for an instant. She found ways to have me punished, whether she was present or not. She had gotten herself into such a state that she believed I was simply bad, and that if she didn't get bad reports about me, then it could only mean that someone was covering up for me. One night she was furious when she'd been told on the phone that I'd worn my coat during class, which was against the dress code rules. Then she said that if I was so determined to wear my goddamn coat to class, I could wear it and nothing else. She said my clothes would be picked up the next day. Mother, I interrupted, the coat only has one button. I can't wear just that to school. You should have thought of that before you disobeyed, she snapped. And without another word, she slammed the phone down, hanging up on us. Mrs. Chadwick was ashen. She put her arms around me, and I burst into tears. Mrs. Chadwick, why did you tell Mother that? She looked down at the floor and then straight at me. She simply wouldn't accept the fact that you're doing well. She insisted I go over each day in detail until I came to the business about the coat. Her voice trailed off, and the two of us sat in silence. 
Mrs. Chadwick, I am not going to school in just my underwear and that coat. I don't care what Mother said or didn't say. I'm not going out of this house in my underwear and a coat. Someone will have to forcibly drag me out, and I'll fight every inch of the way. I will not do it. I was surprised at the forcefulness with which I'd told her how I felt. It was the first time I'd ever done that. The next day, just as I predicted, Mother sent someone to get all my clothes while I was at school. They cleaned me out. They took everything but one short sleeve cotton dress. Since it was only February, that left me with two dresses to wear for the next four months. I was so mad I couldn't talk. I was also mad at Mrs. Chadwick for telling Mother in the first place. I told her that when Mother was drinking, she became totally irrational, but up until now, I don't think she really believed me. I didn't go to most of the school dances because I was too embarrassed to appear in either one of my two dresses when all the other girls had special outfits. Anyway, none of the boys asked me because they didn't want to be embarrassed either. As the months progressed, my punishment had some unexpected side effects. I sensed an invisible turning of the tide. I was too proud to ever complain, but people started going out of their way to give me encouragement, extra credit, little additional privileges, whatever was in their direct responsibility and didn't break any existing rules. When school was finally over in June, I went home for a few weeks. I tried to get to know my sisters again. They were about five and cute little girls. I realized they were growing up without knowing me very well because I'd been away at school most of the last couple of years. Mother took all of us to Alisol Ranch in the San Inez Valley for a week. We liked Alisol because of its casual atmosphere. We were free to go riding and swimming all day and didn't have to check in with Mother every few hours. Before that summer was over, I was allowed to spend one week with a girlfriend at her family beach house. I felt like Rip Van Winkle waking up in a strange world. This was the first time I'd experienced what was considered a fairly typical teenage romp through summertime, complete with beach parties, drive-ins, and blind dates. It was like paradise for me.